Good morning, friends. I want to extend a warm welcome to you today. Everyone is welcome here. This community is a safe place to bring, your, bring yourself forth. In this safe place, we support each other in the sacred task of becoming, celebrate the transcending mystery of life, and rely on the transforming power of love. The theme of this service today is democracy and women's suffrage. We will probably run about 10 minutes longer than our usual hour. There's a lot in the service today. Even so, I hope that everyone will stick around for the after service chats and circle talk, where everyone will have a chance to give voice to their thoughts. The after service talks are really the most important part of the service. Your presence and what you have to say there is valuable to the life of this community. I was 13 years old when I became a Unitarian Universalist. I was raised in this faith but I was 13 when I claimed it as my own. It was a Sunday afternoon, and I was waiting for my parents to finish their committee meetings after service. All the other kids had left and I was bored. I wandered into the visitor's corner, and a little red wallet card caught my eye. It said in bold letters on the front, what do Unitarian Universalists believe? My 13-year-old self wondered, what do Unitarian Universalists believe? As I read the 10 statements written by the Reverend David O. Rankin, in my heart, in my soul, as I read those words, I said, yes, this is what I believe. One phrase in particular planted itself in me like the deepest truth, and I never forgot it. We believe in the motive force of love. It was in that moment when I knew that this was my religion. I start with this story to ground the work of You, You, The Vote in our theology, which is its foundation and its inspiration. This year marks the 250th anniversary of what we celebrate as the beginning of universalism in the United States. It was on September 30th, 1770, that Universalist John Murray preached his first sermon on this continent. And the truth that I read in that little red wallet card, the truth I've never forgotten, is the message of Universalism. 250 years ago, in the context of religious notions of God rooted in punishment, damnation, and the division of humanity between worthy and unworthy, saved and damned, the idea of universal salvation, that God's love is unconditional, that no one is cast out, and that salvation is not individual but collective, was radical and liberating. Universalism proclaimed that humanity was bound together in a common destiny and that love, love is the thread that binds each of us to the other and everyone to creation. Universalists believe that God is love. They also believed in hell. They just believed that it existed here and now on the earth. The great universalist preacher Hosea Ballou was clear about how politicians and those in power used fear, stoked fear, to protect their greed and corruption and self-interest, and he knew the suffering that resulted from that. Rather than speak of theology in terms of speculative notions of God, Ballou spoke of it in terms of human experience here and now and our relationships to each other. A society that lives out the motive force of love would be one that fosters joy and liberation and thriving for all people. This is the highest calling of our faith as Unitarian Universalists, to live out, defend, and embrace this motive force of love in our lives, in our actions, in our commitments, and in our society. This is why you, you, the vote says vote love. Today, in our context, we are witnessing the emboldening and authorization of ideologies rooted not in love and interdependence but in domination, authoritarianism, and dehumanization. 
And just to be clear, this is not new. It has a long and deadly history on this continent, going back more than 400 years. And yes, even our universalist ancestors came from that same lineage of Christian European conquest and limited the vision of universalism only to white society, a limit that we are still trying to redeem ourselves from. It is dehumanization that creates systems that put children in cages, that deny health care to our transgender siblings, that allow police violence and the murder of black people to continue unabated and without accountability. Dehumanization that allows triage protocols that devalue the lives of disabled people and that lead to systemic divestment from communities. The resources from housing to education, healthcare to jobs, and the criminalization of poverty. Just as Hosea Ballou named it, the tool of dehumanization, its propaganda is fear. Propaganda that tells us to fear our neighbor, that we are not family and kin, but enemies. This is the exact opposite of our theology of universalism that tells us that we have a common destiny and we are connected to one another in love. This is why you, you, the vote says vote, love, defeat, hate. And while the forces of dehumanization and domination have always been a part of U.S. history, so too have been those who have resisted and organized for the values of dignity, equity, humanity, and love. These days are heartbreaking, they're infuriating, and they're frightening. On days when I lose my own strength, I turn to the words of Alice Walker, who reminds us, we remember our ancestors because it is an easy thing to forget that we are not the first to suffer, rebel, fight, love, and die. The grace with which we embrace life in spite of the pain and the sorrow is always a measure of what has gone before us. We remember our ancestors, theological, familial, and in movement. We remember Francis, Ellen Watkins, Harper, Hosea Ballou, John Brown, Sitting Bull, Ida B. Wells, Dr. King, Anne Braden, and so many more whose names history does not remember. Those who struggled and risked and fought and loved for the principles of justice, equity, liberty. This is why in You, You, The Vote, we say vote love, we say defeat hate, because dear ones, we are on a precipice. Every single one of our most deeply held values is on the line right now. The current powers in government are showing in everything they do that the inherent worth and dignity of so many immigrants, black people, disabled folks, trans and queer people does not matter to them. Human agency, interdependence, the democratic process are being disrupted and defiled daily. It is a radical act of faith to not only continue to believe in all of our cherished principles, but to demand them by speaking out, taking risks, organizing, leveraging our resources and building networks of solidarity and power to protect one another and these values. We are on a precipice and our actions right now will affect whether we have a chance to continue to bring our bold values forward, to rebuild, expand, and strengthen our democracy, to confront police violence, to upend racial inequity, to change divestment from communities, and make moves to protect the climate. Now is the time to draw on the grace, the courage, and the strength of all those who went before, to widen our comfort zones, and to do all we can to vote love and defeat hate. If you haven't taken any form of action yet, sign up for a shift with You, You, The Vote. I can tell you that it's fun. And if you've written postcards to voters, but you feel nervous about phone banking, do it with your fellow UUs. And if you've been all in with you, you, the vote from the beginning, keep it up and start planning for how you will show up and organize after November 3rd.
because democracy will not be restored in one election. It's been under systemic attack for decades and justice will not roll down like waters in one election. Voting matters, it's absolutely critical, but it is not the end. It is just one piece of the long haul work of organizing for a future where all are free and where all can thrive. Will you show up in the streets, set up to contribute to a bail or legal assistance fund, open your church building to protesters needing refuge from state repression, tap into your own endowment or discretionary funds to make sure that grassroots organizers have the funds they need for their work. There is so much to do. And our faith calls us to love more radically, to give more generously, to believe more fervently that another world is possible and be willing to be all in for that future. As you've heard me say many times before, this is no time for a casual faith, no time for a casual commitment to what you hold most dear. And this is no time to go it alone. Friends, we are in this work together. I invite you to be deeper in this work of you, you, the vote with us. May we remember that we are held by love always. May we remember that we are held by and with one another. And may we all together be all in today, tomorrow, next month, and next year for justice, for love, for democracy, for a future that is free and thriving for all people. May it be so. And now our hymn, special hymn today. <laughs> woman and hear me roar in numbers too big to ignore and I know too much to go back and pretend cause I've heard it all before and I've been down there on the floor and no one's ever gonna keep me down again oh yes I'm wise and it's wisdom for the pain oh yes I paid the price but look how much I gained If I have to I can do anything I am strong I am invincible I am woman You can bend but never break me Cause it only serves to make me More determined to achieve my final goal and I'll come back even stronger Not a novice any longer Cause you've deepened the conviction in my soul Oh yes, I'm wise But it's wisdom for the pain Oh yes, I paid the price But look how much I gained If I have to, I can do anything I am strong I am invincible. invincible, I am a woman I am woman, watch me grow See me standing toe to toe As I spread my loving arms across the land But I'm still an embryo With a long, long way to go Until I make my brother understand Oh yes, I'm wise But it's wisdom for the pain Ooh, Yes, I pay the price But look how much I gain If I have to, I can face anything I am strong I am invincible I am
but I do see uh, I do see uh, Bridget and uh, uh, Ada and uh, Iris playing with fire. I, so they're, maybe they're lighting the chalice. There we go. We're going to let that be our chalice lighting for today. The uh, the fire that Ada and Iris are are. Oh, oh you're blowing them out. Let's try again. <laughs> we'll light it from we'll light it from Iris's. These are our chalices that we made from the um, RE kits. You want to do this one, Iris? Ada, light yours. So these are our new chalices at our house. Wow, very nice. Thank you, girls, and thank you, Bridget. That was great. And let's move on to our affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and love, and to help one another. You're able to see it. The book is called I Could Do That. Esther Morris gets women the vote. And in 1820, six-year-old Esther McQuig studied her mother making tea. I could do that, she said. Make tea, asked Mama. The older girls do that. But I want to learn, said Esther, and she did. She pumped water into the kettle and set it upon the wood stove to boil. She scooped tea leaves into the teapot and then poured steaming water over them. Esther strained the tea into cups, one for her mother and one for herself. As they sat near the window of their New York house, Esther saw men riding by in their best suits, some carrying flags. Where are those men going, Mama? asked Esther. They're going to vote for the next president of the United States, Mama said. Will Papa vote? Yes, Papa always votes. Will you vote, Mama? No, dear, only men can vote. When Esther was eight, she watched her mother sew a fine seam. The needle pulled thread in and out, in and out, tracking tiny even stitches across the fabric. Esther felt her hands mimicking her mother's. I could do that, she said, and she did. She made clothes for her doll from scraps, and when her stitches became neat and straight, she sewed a shirt for Papa. When Esther was 11, her mother died, and for the first time, she saw her father cry. He gathered his 11 children together. I don't know what we'll do without your mama, he said. I'm depending on each of you to be brave and to take care of one another. Esther, eighth of the 11, cried too. But then she said, I could do that, Papa. And she did. When Esther was 19, six feet tall and on her own, she earned a living making dresses with leg of mutton sleeves for society ladies. When the ladies wanted hats to match the dresses, Esther designed and made those too. Soon she thought of opening a millinery shop. You are much too young to run a business, she was told. I don't see why, was Esther's reply. And with that, she opened a hat shop in the way to New York. Esther started attending abolitionist meetings at her church, but a throng of people who believed in the right to own slaves threatened to stop the meetings, even if they had to tear down the Baptist church where they were held. I can't do that. You, you can't do that, Esther said. I'll stop anyone who tries. When Esther was 28, she married Artemis Slack, and a few years later, they had a son called Archie. But when Artemis died in an accident, Esther made a big decision. I'm moving to Illinois, she told her friends. I'll claim the land Artemis owned there and raised our son. You can't do that, her friends cried. Illinois is the very edge of civilization. It's full of dangerous people and wild animals. Yes, yes. she said. I can. And that was that. In Illinois, she fought long and hard to claim Artemis's land, but she was denied her inheritance because she was female. So Esther opened another hat shop. 
Esther met and married John Morris, a merchant, an immigrant from Poland, and in 1851 she gave birth to twin boys, Edward and Robert. But John had a hard time making a living. So while Esther raised the children, cooked the meals, washed the clothes, she helped earn the money too. When Esther was 46, she went with John to the presidential election polls and watched through the window while he voted. You know, she told him when he came out. I could do that. Politics is the men of business, is the business of men, my dear, he said, <laughs> said Esther. It's our country too. When war broke out between the Northern and Southern states, Esther was proud that her son Archie joined the victorious fight of the, of the North to end slavery. Soon after, an amendment to the Constitution granted Negro men all rights of citizenship, including the right to vote. When Esther heard Susan B. Anthony speaking about women's rights, Esther began to hope that someday women might vote too. In 1869, when Esther was 55, she and her 18-year-old sons moved to the newly formed Wyoming Territory, where John and Archie, who'd gone there the year before, waited. Esther and her boys traveled by train across miles of prairie and then by stagecoach over rocky hills to South Pass City, a dusty, hurriedly built town where gold had been found. Most of the 2,000 people who lived there were rowdy young men. They worked in the mines by day and drank in the saloons by night. The Morrises moved their belongings into a small log cabin and South Pass City became home. John ran a saloon, Archie brought a printing press and started a newspaper, and Esther opened another hat shop. But with six men to every woman, there was always a need for someone to nurse the sick and wounded, sew clothes, deliver babies, and give motherly advice to the few young women in town. I could do that, Esther said, and she did. One day, Esther read a proclamation tacked to a wall. All male citizens, 21 and older, are called to vote in the first territorial elections. Esther looked around at the disorderly young men. It's time I did that, she said. When Esther's son watched her march toward home, they knew it was more likely that things were about to change than that things would stay the same. Esther invited the two men running for the territorial legislature to her house to speak to the citizens. Then she sent out invitations to the most influential people in the territory. Come for tea and talk to the candidates. She scrubbed her tiny home from top to bottom, washed the, cur washed the curtains, and ironed her best dress. When the candidates and guests arrived, Esther served them tea. One thing I like about Wyoming, she said, is how everyone is important. It takes all of us to run the town, women as well as men. Yes, her guests agreed. And it's a place where people aren't afraid to try new things. Her guests agreed again. Esther smiled and she turned to the candidates. Then would you, if, if elected, introduce a bill in the legislature that would allow women to vote? Suddenly, in that tiny room full of people, not a sound was heard. Finally, Colonel William Bright spoke. Mrs. Morris, my wife, would like to vote too. She is intelligent and well-educated. Truth be told, she would be a more informed voter than I. If I am elected, I will introduce that bill. Not wanting to be outdone, the other candidate, Herman Nickerson, also agreed. Applause broke out in that tiny cabin, and Esther dropped to her chair. Thank you, she said. People warned her that once the bill was introduced, the men of the legislature would have to approve it, and the governor would have to sign it. This had never happened anywhere. Why did she think it could happen here? But Esther had seen that things that were not likely to happen happened every day. She wrote letters and visited legislatures to make sure this bill would happen too. And it did. On December 10th, 1869, Governor John Campbell signed this bill into law. Wyoming women get to vote. Women across the country rejoiced for the women of Wyoming. Some people didn't like it. 
Only eight days later, Judge J James Stillman, the, the county's justice of the peace, turned in his resignation. He refused to administer justice in a place where women helped make the laws. Word went out that a new justice of the peace was needed. Esther's boys turned to her. Mama, you could do that, they said. And so she applied. Archie, then clerk of the court, proudly swore his mother in, making Judge Esther Morris the first woman in the country to hold public office. But Judge Stillman refused to turn over the official court docket to Esther. Never mind, she said. Archie, will you please go home to the mercantile, mercantile and, and buy me a letter? I'll start my own docket. And of course, she did. On September 6, 1870, one year after her tea party, Judge Esther Morris put on her best dress and walked with her husband John and her sons down the dusty street to the polling place. She would be one of a thousand Wyoming women voting that day, the first ever given that right permanently by any governing body of the United States. As they walked, John, who still didn't think women should vote, tried to coach her on which candidates and issues to vote for. Esther held up her hand. I can do this she said. And she did. Oh, my God. <laughs> A great book. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. This fellowship is a community of ourselves. Its resources are our resources. Its wealth is what we share. As we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within it. And thank you all for your generosity. I'm on the phone. Oh, yeah. Okay, very good. You can plug her back in. Okay, uh, let's, Gloria's on the phone. So let's, uh, Gloria, please uh, proceed with your poem. <laughs> okay, my poem. Okay, um, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Jim asked me to be the poet this morning on patriotism. He did not mention that it was to celebrate the suffragette movement of which I have taken part with the League of Women Voters some time ago. So instead of a poem, I would like to share a story. It was 1941 in New York City. The country was at war. I was sitting on a stool at Needix where you could buy a date nut cream cheese sandwich and their famous, very famous orange drink for less than 50 cents. I was reading the paper when a small headline caught my eye. Be patriotic, come down to Canal Street and sign up. Well, that's it. I headed on down to Canal Street and signed up. What an opportunity. Women, as well as men, can serve our country. My father was delighted. He listened to his friends for years talking, for months talking about, proudly, very proudly about their sons that were serving then. And now he could proudly do the same for his daughter. The right of citizens shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. My country tis of thee. Sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. And uh, let's uh, move right to Nancy Gilpin's uh, reading, if we could. Nancy, can you uh, bring your reading for us right now? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. This is my brief but spectacular take on the importance of lesbian couples in the suffrage movement. In the mid 19th century, most men and even some women did not take the suffrage movement seriously. They thought it was a joke. Women were thought to be too emotional not intelligent enough, they did not understand, and were not supposed to know anything about public affairs. The home was their responsibility, 
As Eleanor Smeal, the equal rights leader stated, they were expected to have many children, not complain, and make everything look easy. Even as late as 1916, a front page Sunday editorial in the New York Times warned men of a grave and imminent danger. Every man of voting age must meet the issue courageously, intelligently, with clear vision, because to grant suffrage to women is repugnant. Without the counsel of men, no woman ever ruled a state wisely and well. The defect is innate and one for which a cure is both impossible and not to be desired. In fact, one journalist, in order to dismiss or demean the movement, started calling the suffragists suffragette. Suffragette. Clearly, it was an uphill battle, a long, hard climb. Lillian Satterman, who's a well-known uh, author on queer, lesbian history and literature, in her book published in 2000, To Believe in Women, What Lesbians Have Done for America, argues that the only way these women could have affected change on such a large scale was through close relationships with other women. Women without all the domestic responsibilities had more time and energy to devote to the movement. Plus, if the woman was lesbian and lived with another woman who shared her interests and inclinations, their time and energy combined was greatly expanded and more influence, they had more influence and allowed these women to achieve more impressive contributions to suffrage. Fetterman says, these women were not just fighting for themselves, they were fighting for their beloved. One couple, Mary Chapman Catt and Molly Garrett Hay were one of those couples, and Catt was president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which I'll refer to as I'll just call it the Suffrage Association, a uh, huge organization. Catt was instrumental in getting the 19th Amendment passed. She enjoyed a 30-year relationship with Molly Hay, who was the president on the New York state level of the Equal, Equal Suffrage League. Even though Catt had been previously married two times, she demanded to be buried next to Molly rather than either of her husbands and their gravestones sit side by side in New York City's Woodlawn Cemetery. Another couple, Anna Howard Shaw and Lucy Anthony, the niece of Susan B. Anthony, both of whom knew Cat and Hay. Anna Howard Shaw was a physician and one of the first ordained female Methodist ministers in America and served as the president of that suffrage association for over 10 years. She was so critical to the movement and so greatly loved by so many that when she died, the New York Times in a eulogy compared her to Abraham Lincoln. Her partner, Lucy Anthony, working alongside her to support her, helped organize international support for suffrage. Another social reformer, Susan B. Anthony, was also important to this movement. She had a relationship with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Stanton was the main force behind the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention, which is really the first convention to bring together women to discuss women's rights and is considered the start of the suffrage movement. That's 1848 in New York. At that time, Stanton was the primary author of the Declaration of Sentiments at that, at that particular convention, which was modeled after the, de after the de Declaration of Independence and spelled out the reasons why women should have the vote. It was signed by 68 women and 32 men, Biographer Kathleen Berry calls Anthony and Stanton one of the great couples of the 19th century America. Another suffragist, Sophonispa Breckenridge, the first woman to get a PhD in political science at UConn at the University of Chicago, served as vice president of the Suffrage Association. She had two lovers, both on the University of Chicago campus, Marion Talbot, who was the University Dean of Women, and Edith Abbott, Dean of the School of Social Service Administration. Needless to say, Marion and Edith were not close friends. These were powerful. I'm wearing white to honor them, a color of clothing that they adapted in order to stress their femininity and not to challenge men. Plus in the newspapers, which were black and white, they got better coverage if they were dressed in white. As one suffrage said, some say they gave us the vote. They didn't give us the vote, we took the vote. I'm Nancy Gilpin and this is my brief but spectacular take 
on the importance of lesbian couples to the suffrage movement. Amen, and thank you, Nancy. Uh, and now our meditation music, Listen to the Voices. Listen to the voices of the First Nations. Mm. Listen to the voices of the First Nations. Calling out the messages of the earth and sky. Telling us what we need to know in order to survive. Listen to the voices of the First Nations. Listen to the voices of the old women. Mm. Listen to the voices of the old women. Calling out the messages of the moon and sea. Telling us what we need to know in order to be free. Listen to the voices of the old women. Listen to the voices of the young children. Mm. Listen to the voices of the young children. Calling out the messages of the heart and soul. Telling us what we used to know before the lies were told. Listen to the voices of the young children. Mm. Listen to the voices of the young children. Listen to the voices of the old women. Mm. Listen to the voices of the First Nations. Listen to the voices of the living. Now Bridget will bring our message for today. Okay, I'm getting there. All right, I think I actually got it shared this time. All right. So lifting as we climb, onward and upward we go, struggling and striving and hoping that the buds and blossoms of our desires will burst forth into glorious fruition ere long. Lifting as we climb, used in this quote by Mary Church Terrell, would become the slogan for the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. The sentiment communicates the reality of their position at the bottom rung of the socioeconomic ladder. As Mary Burnett Talbert puts it, with us as colored women, this struggle becomes twofold. First, because we are women, and second, because we are colored women. But it also belies their determination not to step on the rights of others in their climb, but rather to elevate the position of all. This attitude contrasted with their potential allies, both white women, And men, and men of color. White women suffragettes made their case for voting based on education and social status to the exclusion of colored people. Famous white suffragette Elizabeth Cady Stanton was known to have made racist remarks, outraged by the idea that black men might obtain the right to vote before white women. Black men were reluctant to cede their position of power as heads of the household, church, and community. Both groups wanted the support of black women, but ignored the challenges African that African-American women faced. 
black feminist reformers understood that both their race and their sex affected their rights and opportunities. Black women were excluded from the 1848 Women's Convention in Seneca Falls, but were already hard at work in churches, anti-slavery societies, and women's clubs seeking the vote to further what they termed human rights for men and women alike. They were rarely single issues in their concerns. They battled for political rights while also advancing, sorry, while also advocating for temperance, education, prison reform, and the rights of working people. They especially attended to troubles that arose at the crossroads of race and gender. This beautiful quote of Anna Julia Cooper sums up the cause of universal suffrage. It is not the intelligent woman versus the ignorant woman, nor the white woman versus the black, the brown, or the red. It is not even the cause of woman versus man. Nay, it is woman's strongest vindication for speaking that the world needs to hear her voice. Beginning in the 1830s and 40s, formerly enslaved women, including Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman, fought for women's rights and suffrage. It was at a women's right meeting in Akron, Ohio in 1851 that Truth delivered her anti-woman speech to considerable opposition to her position. If the first woman turned the world upside down, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and the men better let them. Sarah Ramond won, ex won acclaim at the 1858 National Women's Right Convention in New York City by saying, the free colored people of the North States are of no crime, but merely the fact of complexion, deprived of all political and social rights. Whatever wealth or eminence in intellect or refinement they may attain, they are treated as outcasts. Individual white suffragists openly campaigned against the 15th Amendment, allowing black men to vote. But it was passed in 1869 with support from black suffragists like Mary Church Terrell, counting on their support in return. For an intelligent colored man to oppose women's suffrage is the most preposterous and ridiculous thing in the world. In 1869, Louisa Rowland courageously proclaimed her support for universal suffrage in the floor of the North Carolina, sorry, South Carolina House of Representatives. She and her four sisters, Frances, Catherine, Lottie, and Florence, were prominent in women's suffrage campaigns at the local and national levels. We ask suffrage not as a favor, not as a privilege, but as a right, based on the grounds that we are human beings and as such entitled to all human rights. We claim that public opinion has had a tendency to limit women's sphere to too small a circle. And until woman has the right to representation, this will last and other rights will be held by insecure tenure. Abolitionist Mary Ann Shad Carey, who's the first black American female publisher, attempted to vote in Washington DC in 1871. She was prevented from casting a ballot, but she insisted upon an affidavit recognizing her attempt. A tireless writer, publisher, and reformer, Shad Carey became the second black female lawyer at the age of 60. She wrote to encourage hardworking souls, it is better to wear out than to rust out. Mm -hmm. In a speech delivered at the 1873 black suffrage, sorry, 1873 convention, black suffragist Frances Ellen Watkins Harper shared her view that women of color should not be excluded from American suffrage. We are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity and society cannot trample on the weakest and feeblest of its members without receiving the curse in its own soul. Her sentiments were echoed by Adela Logan Hunt who wrote in 1912, if white American women with all their natural and acquired advantages need the ballot, how much more do black Americans, male and female, need the strong defense of a vote to help secure their right to life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Nanny Helen Burroughs wrote in a 1915 essay that when the ballot is put into the hands of the American woman, the world is going to get a correct estimation of the Negro woman. It will find her a tower of strength of which poets have never sung, orators have never spoken, and scholars have never written. And that women need the ballot to reckon with men who place no value upon her virtue and to mold healthy public sentiment in favor of her own protection. Ida B. Wells Barnett organized the Chicago-based Alpha Suffrage Club in 1913. Born into slavery and orphaned at age 16, Wells was a crusader for social justice of all types. The way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. 
The 19th Amendment was passed in June of 1919 and ratified in August of 1920. By that time, 20 states had already granted women the ballot. This amendment was hardly cause of for celebration for Wells. She wrote in 1921, under the authority of a national law that gave every citizen the right to vote, the newly made citizens chose to exercise their suffrage. But the reign of the national law was short-lived and illusionary. Hardly had the sentences dried upon the statute books before one Southern state after another raised the cry against Negro domination and proclaimed that there was an unwritten law that justified any means to resist it. Holly Quinn Brown was another activist that was not able to rest as Jim Crow laws still prevented many from voting with poll taxes, literacy tests, and more. In 1926, she urged society to cleave more tenaciously to the truth and to battle more heroically for the right. Other women of color were relying on these newly minted voters to support their own causes of enfranchisement. Zitkala Saw, a member of the Dakota Nation, writer, opera composer, and reformer for Native Opportunities and Cultural Preservation, wrote in 1920, now the time is at hand when the American Indian shall have his day through the help of the women of America. Native women would not be able to vote until 1957. In 1913, when she was just a teenager, Mabel Ping Hua Li, a Chinese immigrant, led a parade of 10,000 through the streets of New York. She wrote that true feminism is nothing more than the extension of democracy or social, social justice and equality of opportunities to women. She was denied the vote even after the 19th Amendment was ratified by the Chinese Exclusion Act. Chinese Americans were finally granted the vote in 1946 with the passage of the Magnuson Act. For black women, especially in Southern states, the struggle for the vote extended for decades more to 1965 when the Voting Rights Act would finally topple barriers constructed by Jim Crow. This act represented more than a century of work by black women to make voting easier and more equitable. Latino women and men would have to wait 10 years more for an extension of the Voting Rights Act to include those with language barriers before they could vote without restrictions. Jovita Idar was a Mexican-American journalist that single-handedly protected her Mexican newspaper headquarters when the Texas Rangers came to shut it down. In 1911, she advocated for women's education and suffrage and is known for writing, when you educate a woman, you educate a family. The 19th Amendment, like the 15th Amendment, sadly did not remake the Constitution into a guarantee of voting rights. It is true that the amendment references such a right, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied, but that mention is an illusion. There is no fixed reference point in the Constitution. The United States is, in fact, one of the few constitutional democracies that extends no such right in its governing charter. States, not the federal government, appoint voters. Millions of women were already voting before 1920. And because, that, and because what women technically won was only non-discrimination in voting on the basis of sex, millions of, of women still could not vote after 1920. Given this, we cannot pinpoint a single date when women won the vote, reflecting just how localized govern, voter governance is in the United States. After 1920, court cases, federal laws, and two more constitutional amendments, barring poll taxes and lowering the voting age, have continued to stop disenfranchisement, but none of these federal measures have assured Americans of a right to vote. Securing that right remains the unfinished work of this hard-fought historical legacy. And so a call to action in the words of Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, if laws are unjust, they must be continually broken until they are altered. Amen, thank you, Bridget. Bravo. Very lovely and well-researched uh, and inspirational message today. Uh, let's move on to our hymn. We are building a new way. We are building a new way. We are building a new way, feeling stronger every day. 
blessings share and hearts be grateful everywhere amen and thank you thank you to everyone who uh, took part in the service today i must say this was